So uh, my name is Alex Razumov. I'm a visualization and training coordinator with Westgrid. And uh, today's webinar is going to be very introductory, how to submit and run jobs in Compute Canada. But I'm also going to talk about uh, some other introductory topics. So before you submit jobs, you have to be able, uh, you have to log into the cluster. You have to know how to navigate your way around. So we're going to talk about the software environment, basic Linux commands, and so on. But most of, most of the talk will be dedicated to the scheduler and uh, submitting jobs. Uh, so you can find the copy of these slides at the web link uh, below. Uh, so it's bit.ly forward slash 2d40vml. Uh, so just copy it now. Okay. And uh, while you're copying it, uh, I'll just mention that this is uh, the first Westgrid webinar this fall. So we're going to have a bunch of webinars, about uh, eight or nine webinars this fall. Uh, the next one is actually tomorrow on uh, expansion to uh, Abutis cloud system. Uh, but the regular time uh, for webinars is Wednesday, uh, this exact time, so 10 o'clock Pacific, every two weeks. So the next regular scheduled webinar is going to be in two weeks. Okay. So a couple of household items, housekeeping items uh, before we proceed. Uh, so if you have any questions, there, is a different, uh, there are different ways you can ask them. Uh, if you're watching uh, via web stream, uh, so you have just the web browser, but not the video client. You can simply send an email to info at westgrid.ca. And a few times during the talk, I'll, I'll monitor, I'll, I'll check this email. Uh, if you're using video, then you can always uh, use group chat. So if you mouse over the video client, you will see uh, a, a row of buttons at the, near, near the bottom. And uh, the button on most likely the, most, uh, the, the rightmost button is the one to open the chat uh, sub window, and there you can type your questions. So I'll monitor this once in a while as well. And you can also unmute yourself. So feel free, this is fairly informal, so we don't have that many people. Uh, feel free to unmute yourself and ask questions via audio. But if you're not asking any questions, uh, make sure to mute yourself so that we don't get any background noise. So also, this talk is being recorded. So if you don't want your video to appear, please mute your video as well. All right, so let's proceed. I will start with a very quick uh, cluster overview, so the overview of uh, the big systems we have in Compute Canada. So uh, for the past two years, uh, we, uh, we had a number of systems that uh, went into production. Uh, so the major, uh, major expansion started with Abutus, a cloud system at the University of Victoria that went into production two years ago. And it's a cloud uh, system for, so for spinning virtual machines. It's not a cluster, so I'm not going to talk about Abutus today. Today I'm going to uh, talk about regular high-performance computing clusters, so HPC systems such as Cedargram. So CETA is a supercomputer at the cluster at, the university, uh, at Simon Fraser University, where I'm based. Uh, Gram is a cluster at the University of Waterloo. So uh, these two systems went into production uh, a, bit more, uh, a bit more than uh, a year ago. And uh, they are meant to be general purpose clusters. So for running any type of jobs, so large parallel jobs, small parallel jobs, serial jobs, and so on. So their setup is very similar. I'm going to talk about the setup in the next slide. Uh, Niagara is a newer system at the University of Toronto. And Niagara is meant primarily for running uh, large parallel jobs. So the details of setup on Niagara are slightly different from those on Cedar and Graham. And we have one more system called Beluga that is coming online probably at the end of this year or early next year. So it's going to be in Quebec. And Beluga setup is going to be very similar to that of Cedar and Graham, also a general purpose uh, computing cluster. So uh, a slide with a big table, uh, the specs of uh, CEDA and Gram. So to end users, uh, CEDA to you, uh, CEDA and Gram are supposed to be very similar to each other. So the software environment is exactly the same on both systems. So you should not really, uh, you don't really have to know the, all the underlying details. But just to show you what type of nodes we have. So uh, the uh, uh, CEDA has about 60,000 uh, CPU cores. Uh, Gram is small, about 33,000 uh, CPU cores. So CEDA was actually expanded uh, about five months ago. So it used to have about 30,000 and then it doubled in size about five months ago. So the older uh, CPUs are Broadwell type CPUs. The new ones are Skylake type CPUs. So again, in most cases, you don't have to know the difference between the two. So you should be able to run the vast majority of applications on either uh, processor. In very few rare cases, when you have to uh, distinguish between the two, in actual one is the job, you can uh, use a flag dash dash constraint equal to either Broadwell or Skylake. Uh, but for most part, you don't have to worry about it. So uh, we have a large variety of nodes on both CEDA and Gram, as you can see in this table. Uh, what we call the base nodes, uh, the, that absolute smallest memory base nodes have 120 gigabytes of memory per node. 
and 32 cores per node. So that gives you an equivalent of four gigabytes per processor. So four gigabytes per core is an important number and I'm gonna come back to that number a few times uh, during the talk. So just, uh, just uh, keep note of it. We also have uh, larger memory nodes. Um, so same number of cores, 32 cores per node, but uh, mem memory with, uh, so 256 gigabytes, half a terabyte and all the way to three terabytes. So these large memory uh, nodes are uh, meant for uh, well demanding large memory jobs. So usually these are shared memory jobs uh, that cannot scale beyond a single node, but for some reason they require a lot of memory. So these are the nodes you can, you can submit these jobs to. So when you submit jobs, I'm, I'm gonna talk about all of the flags and details soon. When you submit jobs, all you have to do is specify the amount of memory and then depending on how much memory you're asking, your job uh, will be uh, assigned to one of these nodes. So we also have the GPU petition. So if you're running code that make, makes use of uh, GPUs, we also have hardware to do that. And as you can see, the, the very last row uh, shows the Skylake uh, nodes on, um, on, um, on CETA. So roughly half of CETA is this new Skylake uh, processes. So uh, the details of setup on uh, Niagara are somewhat different. Uh, so Niagara is a new system, all Skylake processes, and it has 60,000 CPUs. And it's meant primarily for a large, uh, large parallel jobs, so no serial jobs. And uh, there are quite a lot of differences in the setup. Uh, so uh, most importantly, uh, when, uh, if you want to log into Niagara, uh, you will use uh, your Compute Canada, the same regular Compute Canada account as you would use to log into CD and Gram. But you also need to, before you can log into um, uh, to Niagara, you also need to request a sign it account. And so uh, this is, uh, you just need, need to send an email to us. And it's very easy to do, and then you will uh, get un uh, granted access to Niagara. And so a uh, long-term plan is just to let all uh, Compute Canada users uh, um, uh, log into to Niagara without, without any hassle. So uh, the scheduling uh, on Niagara is done by node, and this is because this cluster is meant for uh, running large parallel jobs, so you cannot just run a serial job. And there are some differences between Citigram and Niagara in terms of you know, maximum runtime, how many nodes you're allowed to use and so on. So uh, I list some of these details on, on, on this slide. And for more details, you can check the detailed documentation. So here uh, near the top, I have the uh, links to Niagara documentation and so on. So uh, just briefly to mention, probably most of you already know this, uh, but we have a distinction between RAS, so allocations and uh, regular jobs. So uh, regular jobs, when you, have, when you obtain a Compute Canada account, you can uh, log in immediately and start computing. But roughly 15 to 20% of each cluster is dedicated to regular jobs. So 80 to 85% of each cluster is dedicated to uh, RAC or resource allocation computation jobs. So once a year, we have a uh, computation where PIs, only, only supervisors, so PIs, can, apply, uh, can submit an application, they can apply for resources asking you know, more, more than let's say 50 CPU, um, CPU years or 10 GPU years, perhaps a, an unusually large storage allocation and so on. So these happen once a year and the deadline for application uh, is November 8th this year. So uh, if you need more than, uh, more than uh, what is shown here, so 50 CPU years or 10 GPU years, and then uh, please submit your application. And uh, it's very competitive, so last year, roughly half of all uh, CPU requests uh, could be met and about 20% of all GPU requests. So we're thinking, we think that this year is gonna be about as competitive. So uh, make a good uh, application and, and hopefully, hopefully you'll get an allocation. All right, so uh, file system details. Now we have a, a number of different file systems for different purposes. Uh, so the default home file system is, uh, is uh, well, called home and it's, uh, so it has a quota. So the quota uh, depends, uh, uh, depends on the cluster. So it's 50 gigabytes uh, by default on uh, CEDA and GRAM and uh, 100 gigabytes on Niagara. And on this file system, you cannot have more than half a million files. So the reason is uh, these file systems are not really good for keeping a large number of files. So uh, if you put millions and millions of files, uh, it'll just become uh, very slow, not just for you, but for everybody else. So that's why we have uh, the limit on the number of files as well. And the way it works is uh, you can, uh, so when you submit jobs, if you are over quota, then your jobs will just not start running. So uh, before they can start running, you have to make sure that you uh, bring your usage or disk usage below the, these quotas. 
So uh, Home is a fairly uh, slow, well, medium, medium speed file system. So it's not really meant for storing large output files from your simulations. It's meant primarily for storing, you know, codes, uh, text files, data, but it's not high performance system. So uh, if you have, if you're running code that uh, outputs a lot of data, then uh, we suggest that you use the scratch file system. So if you go to a uh, dollar sign scratch, uh, that's an environment variable, it will forward, it will um, point you to the forward scratch file system. And uh, you can put a lot more stuff there. So we'll also have quarters there, uh, but uh, these file systems tend to uh, get uh, full once in a while or almost full once in a while. So in that case, we ask people to clean stuff. So scratch is a high performing file system but it's not meant for long-term st uh, storage. So we actually have a, a purge policy. So everything older than maybe six weeks, maybe eight weeks, so that depends on current usage and, and how, how busy it is, uh, will be deleted. And we never delete things without letting you know. So we'll send you an email that you have files older than, let's say, six weeks, and these files are going to be deleted in two weeks. And it's your responsibility to move these files. So. Um, we we'll also have a number of other file systems for long-term uh, storage. So project file system, um, it's set up, depends on the cluster. Project on CEDA and Gram is available to everybody, whereas on Niagara, you actually have to ask for it via a Rack application. So uh, project is a long-term disk storage, so it's not high performance, it's not high performance system at all, uh, but it's meant for just storing storing files uh, long term. So if you uh, if your code produces a lot of a lot of data, you typically write this into Scratch, and at the end, after after a, a simulation finishes, you will move these files from uh, Scratch to the project file system. Nearline is a tape archive, and Nearline is not available by default. Uh, somebody, somebody, please mute yourself because you produce a lot of audio. Uh, chin Chin, please mute yourself. There's a lot of background noise, static noise. I'll mute that person now. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Oh, that person is muted again. Excellent. All right, so uh, Newline is a tape archive, and it's not available by default. You actually have to ask uh, for tape storage in your Rack application, and, uh, and then we'll give it to you. And finally, we have Local Scratch, which is a very high-performing uh, high performing file system uh, right on compute nodes. So local scratch is a local SSD that is mounted on each compute node. So that means that it's, uh, it can get full uh, and it will have very high uh, IOPS, so you can actually write files very quickly there, but you need to make sure that you move these files after, uh, out of local scratch to one of the regular file systems because it's only local to your compute node. So you don't see it, for, uh, for example, on the login node, okay? So there are some differences in policies between different uh, different uh, clusters, and I tried to put these differences into the table, but I couldn't fit everything. So if you want to know details, please go to the uh, to the documentation that is linked at the top of the slide. Okay. So now, how to log into a cluster? Well, uh, we uh, accept only uh, secure encrypted uh, logins. So that means that you need to use some sort of a uh, secure uh, SSH client. So SSH uh, stands for uh, secure shell. And uh, this exists for uh, all platforms. So if you are on a Linux or a Mac laptop, these typically come installed already as command line uh, tools. Uh, so you'll just need to open a terminal. And on Windows, you have a number of options. So we recommend Mobile Xterm. And the reason we recommend it because it's free, there's a free edition and it works really well. So it, it contains not only uh, the shell, but file transfer tools and other things, uh, the, the X server as well. But uh, there are a bunch of other options as well. So things like Putty and even in Chrome browser, you can have an SSH, uh, an SSH extension that works just fine. Uh, also in Windows 10 and later, there, are, there is a, what is called the uh, Windows subsystem for, for Linux where you can actually install uh, developer components that will give you a bash shell from which you can, um, in which you can just type your SSH commands directly. So uh, let me show, let me switch to a different window and show how you can log into uh, to the cluster. So hopefully you can see, you can all see this window. This is my terminal on my notebook and this is a, a local terminal. So I'm gonna type SSH and then I'm gonna see my username. So my username is Razumov and I'm gonna log into CEDA, so CEDA dot compute canada 
cda. Okay. So browse off username at cda.computecanada.ca. And I'm going to press enter. And normally it would ask for a password, but I set up a, a, a pair of SSH, um, SSH key pair. So I have a, a private key on my laptop and a public key in uh, one of the subdirectories uh, on, on CEDA. And that way I don't have to type my password every time. And this is really, really handy, especially if you're transferring files a lot, if you're logging in and out a lot, and we have detailed instructions on how to set up an SSH key pair in, in the links in, in this slide. So by the way, when you download the slides, all links are clickable. So that means that uh, you can just right click on it and, and uh, access the documentation directly. So uh, you can also log in with uh, a few options such as SSH minus X or SSH minus Y, and that will let you uh, forward X uh, windows. So X windows is a standard uh, windowing system for Unix on, on the cluster. So that basically means that you can open uh, windows um, uh, applications uh, with remote windows uh, from the cluster right on your laptop. And to do that, you'll have to have some uh, sort of an X server. So MobXTEM provides that. Uh, on Mac, on Linux, usually it's already installed. On Mac, you have to install. There is an uh, X, X11 add-on to the operating system. But anyway, so this lets you open uh, windows uh, remotely. But it's actually a fairly slow way of uh, doing remote applications um, because uh, there are much, much better ways now, things like VNC, X2Go. And we have this installed as well. So these are uh, tools for uh, doing remote desktops. And you can actually start a remote desktop on a login uh, node or on a, on a compute node. And if you're interested in details, we have instructions on this. So just go to our documentation and uh, it will uh, give, you, uh, give you details. So uh, all our systems uh, run Linux, and that means that you need to know the basic Linux commands. And of course, I cannot teach you uh, Linux commands here, but there are lots and lots of um, uh, online tutorials. And I recommend, so recently, uh, there's an organization called Software Carpentry that is dedicated to teaching a basis computing to researchers. And recently, it put together in HPC Carpentry, and there is a subsection of that uh, lesson for learning uh, shell, uh, Linux shell, specifically in the HPC environment. I highly recommend those lessons. And you can actually access the lessons online. So there's a link uh, to HPC Capture website. And they're really, really good. So basically, you'll need to know about 20 or 30 basic uh, Unix commands. And I put a quick cheat sheet here. So basically, the things that are listed here is good to know if you want to uh, work uh, efficiently on the cluster. So lots of, uh, lots of typing. Uh, you can uh, avoid lots of typing by uh, using the tab, so in bash, uh, command line, uh, uh, if you hit, start typing any name or any uh, any command, and if there is a single alternative, hit, hitting tab will expand it. If there is more than a single uh, alt, uh, alternative, then then if uh, hitting tab twice will give you options, and then you can con uh, continue typing. So it saves you lots and lots of uh, time. And also, uh, learn how to, uh, to use aliases, functions in bash, really, really handy and how to set up a, a bash configuration file, bash, .bash .rc in your home directory. Okay. So uh, one other important note, adding remote files. Uh, so if you run codes and if you added things like code, uh, you know, input files or codes on the cluster, really useful to know how to edit remote files. So there are a number of options. Uh, the simplest option is just to run an in-terminal text editor. So there are a bunch of things. Uh, Nano is probably the easiest one for novices. If you know VI or if you know Emacs, these are also available. So I'm going to show you how you can start Nano. So right here, I just logged into the uh, to CEDA, and there I can just type Nano, right? And there you can type some text. Let me exit it. I don't want to save it. Oops, exit, don't save. Uh, you can also start Emacs. So if I type Emacs, hit enter, that will open a window, remote Emacs window, which is going to be very slow, so I don't recommend it. If you want to start uh, Emacs without opening a window right inside the terminal, just pass the and W flags, and this will uh, this will open a, a terminal right here where I can edit my files. For example, I can go to uh, this uh, file and open it, and this is the remote file uh, in Emacs, right? So that will give you editing right inside the terminal. Another option which I, I highly recommend is to run a text editor on your laptop that will let you edit remote files. Uh, so there are a bunch of uh, such uh, text editors. Uh, I, I just use Emacs. Uh, let me drag my Emacs window and just to run a demo. Oops. 
So here's my Emacs window, and hopefully you can see it. So this is local Emacs running on my laptop. And in Emacs, I already have an Alice, for example, to see the uh, file system. So I just go there, and this is my CD file system. So I actually see it from inside my local text editor, and I open a file. So let's see, I go to the same intro HPC codes and file for computing Pi. So you can see this is the syntax you would use inside Emacs. So basically tell Emacs that you need to use SSH, my username on the cluster. So here's then cd.computecan.c, and then the absolute path to the file. And here's my remote file, which you can edit locally. And then when I save it, it will be saved remotely. Really, really handy. Okay. Uh, so if you don't like Emacs, there are a number of other text editors that give you this option. So Atom is an open source multi-platform Windows Linux Mac. There is a commercial option also, uh, Sublime, but it's, uh, it's fairly expensive. So a so number of options, whatever, whatever you prefer. So uh, let's now jump to the cluster software environment. Uh, we have a number of programming languages, so uh, compile languages, C, C++, uh, Fortran, various versions of Fortran, um, Chapel, a new, a new language for parallel programming. And typically for each of these, we have several different flavors and, and different vendors. And we also have Python and R, so interpreted languages. We also have Java, MATLAB, uh, Perl. And all of these are documented in this programming guide that I linked to from the, uh, from the slides. So we're running the open source uh, Sloom uh, job scheduler, and I'm going to jump to the scheduler very soon. Popular software. Uh, so uh, at this link, available software, you can find a list of uh, available software. And then if you click on it, so let me do this. And then let's see if I can drag the browser window, show what it looks like. So uh, here we have a, a list of software, and let me search for, I don't know, for example, MATLAB. And here we have a link to documentation. So if you want to uh, know how to run MATLAB on our clusters, so here's documentation. Same for, I don't know, if you want to use, let's say, Java for some reason. So Java is not the best performing language, but if you want to use Java, just search for Java right on the web page, and here's documentation for uh, running Java on our clusters and, and so on. Right, but of course, we prefer that you run uh, better performing languages, so compile languages, things like C, C++, Fortran, and, uh, and Chapel. Uh, if, you, uh, if you need some software that is not installed on our systems, uh, then let us know. Send an email at, to support at computerpanel.ca. And then uh, depending on uh, how many requests we have for this software, we can install it centrally, or we will help, uh, help you compile it in, uh, in one of your directories. So commercial software we also install. Uh, sometimes we give you a license, so you don't have to buy a license. Sometimes you will have to bring your own license, and in that case, we'll, uh, we'll link to uh, your, your license server. Uh, so parallel programming environment, we have all the standard things, OpenMP. That's the, uh, that's the framework for writing shared memory code. So it has been industry standard for uh, more than 20 years. MPI, message passing interface for writing uh, distributed memory codes that will run or, on, multiple, on multiple nodes so they can scale beyond single node. Uh, we we'll also have Chapel. And here in Westgrid, we started promoting Chapel uh, about a year, a year ago, and we actually now use Chapel for uh, teaching parallel programming concepts. So Chapel is really great because it's a very high performing language. Uh, so same performance as a compiled C++ or Fortran code, but it's, um, it uh, uses, so it's very easy to write in. So it's similar to, a little bit similar to Python in many ways, a very high level language, and it also has high level abstractions for data and test parallelism. So really, really easy to start with parallel programming, whether you want uh, to program for shared memory or for distributed memory. So we also have various frameworks for uh, APIs for doing uh, GPU parallel programming, so CUDA, OpenCL. OpenACC is, uh, is um, provided by PGI compiler on our clusters. Okay. So software modules, um, if you want to uh, switch to a different, a different compiler or different version of a library or different version of software, we have uh, the uh, module system on all clusters. So basically, uh, let me switch to my terminal window and just to show you. If you type module avail, it will show you all software, lots and lots of things that are available as modules on the system. So let's say you're wondering about the Python, uh, which, which Python we have installed. So you can type module avail Python and it will give you the, the options. So uh, we should have yeah, Python uh, 2.7, Python 3.5, Python 3.6. So uh, I can load, uh, let's say, module uh, load. Uh, let's say I want to load the Python uh, 3.6 module. 
I'll just type module load followed by the module name. And then if I want to check that which modules I have loaded, I type module list and it gives me a Python. So now if I type Python dash dash version, it should tell me that I have, so the default version now in my environment is Python 3.6. If for some reason I want to switch to different Python, let's say I'm interested in Python uh, 2.7, uh, I'll just say module load Python 2.7. And it tells that uh, it tells me that it unloaded uh, Python 3 and loaded Python 2. And now, if I type module uh, module list, it should tell me that I have Python 2.7 now loaded. And if I do Python dash dash version, it gives me Python 2.7. So really handy handy tool, uh, handy environment for switching between different uh, versions of uh, libraries and, and, and other and other things. So uh, in this slide, you have a basic module uh, commands. Uh, 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 shown, uh, so module list to show all currently loaded modules. If for some reason you want to unload all modules, some of them are loaded by default, you will type module purge and, and so on. So uh, this is for CD and Gram. On Niagara, the setup is slightly different because Niagara has uh, new processes and their software, all software is compiled by default with optimization for that spe uh, specific um, Skylake architecture. So there we have a somewhat different software stack. If for some reason, uh, but the module system is still available, it's just different uh, list of uh, modules will be available there. If for some reason you still want to use the standard old uh, Compute Canada modules from CETA and Gram on Niagara, you can also do that. So to do that, all you have to do is just uh, you type module load CC env, will load the standard, uh, standard um, Compute Canada software environment on Niagara. Uh, so here's a list of our compilers. Uh, Intel uh, and PGI are com commercial compilers. Uh, GNU is an open source compiler. So this table I always show because it gives you a very handy reference to uh, how, which command you should use to compile the code. So depending on whether you have a serial code, uh, whether you have an OpenMP shared memory code, or whether you have a, um, an API distributed memory code, you will use different commands. So for example, let's say you want to compile a serial code with Intel, you will use, if it's a C code, you will use ICC command. If it's a C++ code with Intel, you will use ICPC. Uh, then if uh, you want to switch to GNU compiler, you will use GCC uh, for, uh, for C++, it will be G++, for Fortran it will be GFortran and so on. So uh, the second, in each compiler family, the second column shows you the MPI commands. So for example, MPICC for compiling a, uh, an MPI parallel C code. And MPICC will call uh, the compiler, uh, so th the compiler for which you have the, the, the right module loaded. So if you have the Intel compiler module loaded, uh, then uh, MPICC will call the Intel compiler. If you have the GNU compiler mod, uh, mod, uh, modded, then MPICC will, uh, will use the GNU compiler and so on. And so the last line in this table show you, shows you the uh, OpenMP flag that you have to use if you want to uh, compile an OpenMP version of, of your parallel code. Okay. So other essential tools. Um, I think this is almost my last slide before going to, to, to scheduling. Uh, so a bunch of things that are really, really useful. And if you've never seen these, uh, please make sure that um, take time, some time to, to learn them. So file management with, um, so gzip, gunzip is uh, compressing files, uh, utility for compressing files. So tar is utility for uh, creating uh, and working with archives. Uh, so build automation with make, really, really useful if you have, especially if you have large codes. Uh, so version control, uh, we usually teach Git, but we also have Mercurial installed as well. So terminal multiplex uh, gives you, it's a very handy tool. Uh, screen is an older version, Tmux is a new version. Uh, so it gives you a, 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 it's a tool for working with, um, uh, it's a terminal multiplexer. So basically you can have a persistent uh, shell that is not tied to window. So you can open a Tmux shell and then you can close the window. You can even power off your laptop and then uh, turn it on again and then reconnect to the same shell. And this is important when you don't want to close your shell, but you have to, let's say, uh, I don't know, leave office and uh, or go to bed at night and you're still compiling things or doing something. So Tmux lets you have persistent shells that uh, that are not tied to actual uh, terminal, terminal windows. So VNC, Exego for remote uh, logins, already mentioned them. Uh, we also have Python, so I'm not going to spend any time on this. Python installed, and you can uh, you can load your own uh, Python library, uh, Python uh, compile, and load your own Python um, uh, Python uh, libraries and build your Python environment. So this slide shows you exactly how to do that. Uh, the same for R. Uh, you can also uh, install uh, R packages either from CRAN or from from other sources, and uh, lots and lots of uh, useful things you can do. 
with R. And uh, this slide, for example, at the bottom shows, uh, sh uh, shows you how uh, different ways how we can work with array jobs uh, with R scripts. All right, so, uh, oh yeah, uh, moving data. So uh, to move data, uh, we accept, uh, so you, you, you need to use some uh, sort of uh, in encrypted tool. So with a secure copy or async or secure FTP. So all this works just fine. And the syntax for them is shown on this slide. So let me just show you a quick a quick command to uh, copy things. Uh, so I just log, logged out from CEDA. I'm back on my system. And let's see, I have some files here. So let's see, I have, uh, I don't know, I copy these slides, slides with PDF and I want to move them to see this. So the way I will do this, I can, can say secure copy slides. So to my account, browse them off at uh, cedar.compute.canada.c column. And then uh, this will copy slides to my home directory on CEDA. And if I get, log into CEDA, I can actually check that the file exists here. So here it is. I just copied it to CEDA. And so uh, depending, on, uh, depending on whether you want to copy a single file or if you want to copy multiple files, you will use some of different syntax. So async is slightly different from secure copy in that it lets you synchronize either directories or um, uh, specified um, sets of files. So really, really handy tool if you're running some simulation and you want to and the simulation outputs a uh, number of uh, files and you just want to synchronize. So download all the latest files from the simulation to your laptop, uh, you would use an async command because it will not copy everything. We'll just download the files that you want to download and so on. So uh, let me not spend more time on this. So finally, Globus, uh, another file transfer tool that we support and it's a web-based tool that will let you uh, open two tabs uh, with two different file systems and really handy tool for a uh, speedy transfer of very large files. So if you regularly transfer things more than a few gigabytes in size, then I highly recommend a Globus file transfer. So go to this website, globus.computecanada.ca and, uh, and uh, there you will see all the, all the instructions and, uh, and uh, you can transfer files very quickly. So uh, now let me jump to the scheduler and actually the main topic of this uh, webinar. Uh, so uh, before I show you how to submit jobs, uh, let me give you a very quick primer on uh, how the scheduler works because this is really, really useful. And I will use several figures uh, that were created by Camille Masinkowski, one, one of uh, the Westgrid staff at the University of Alberta. And I really like these figures because uh, they give you, they answer some uh, really good questions. So for example, I have a job that was, was about to start and uh, now the starting time of the job moved to, you know, moved to, to this afternoon or, or something like this. So uh, we use the job scheduler because uh, cluster, uh, well, each cluster is, is a multi-user environment. So at any given time, we probably have several tens of several hundred people logged in and tens of thousands of jobs either running or waiting at any, any given time. And we need some sort of an automated system to handle all of that. And uh, when you submit a job, so you cannot run a job uh, directly on the login node. You should, any, any production job should be sent to, uh, to the job scheduler. And then you, when you submit a job to the scheduler, you uh, specify resources, for example, how much maximum runtime, how much memory you want to use, how many processing costs, perhaps optionally, how many GPUs you want to use and so on. And the scheduler will take a job it will give you a job ID and then it will start looking for resources. And once the resources that you ask are available, it will start running. And then all output and error will go into the standard files. So uh, we implemented a, we use the Slurm a scheduler with a fair share mechanism. So basically what it means is that each uh, research group has a, what is called a priority, priority or priority level that ranges from uh, six, that, that is a high priority to, to zero. And each uh, group, each research group, has a shared target. So the shared target, if you, don't, if you don't have an allocation, the shared target is simply proportional to the number of uh, group members. Uh, if you have a rack allocation, then it's proportional to your rack allocation. So essentially, uh, the share uh, or shared target is uh, something that is proportional, is, is essentially something that shows your fraction of the cluster that you are allowed to use. And then if you use more than, uh, more than your share, then your priority will go down and vice versa. And then, so that means that um, if you use the cluster a lot, then uh, your jobs will take longer to start. But then if uh, you don't use it for a few days, for a week or so, then your priority will slow or uh, climb back to the default uh, level of six. So uh, this is done this way simply to ensure that everybody has uh, fair access to the cluster and nobody, nobody monopolizes the, the systems, uh, the, the, the system. So uh, very, 
couple of slides, very quick slides, to show you how uh, job scheduling is done. So um, scheduled jobs are arranged uh, in the order of their, their priority, so the priority of the user who submitted the job. And so consider a very simplified picture where you have only two things, uh, runtime and the number of cores. So forget memory, forget GPU, so only cores and the maximum runtime. Let's say we are sitting at the beginning of day one and the blue bars show the jobs that are currently running. So right now, let's say we have only four CPUs in the cluster and there are, they're all busy, all running, all running for, for serial jobs. And let's say there are, uh, the, the jobs that are shown in pink are the jobs waiting, waiting to get started. So the highest priority job, the highest priority user has job one, which is a four core uh, job that takes uh, three days. The second uh, uh, next priority job, number two, is a, a single so serial job that will run for three days. Then number three is a, uh, is a two core job that will run for one day and so on. So uh, the scheduler will uh, first look at job number one and will try to fit it. And obviously, because all four cores are busy, uh, it will not be able to start running this job until the middle of day four, right? So job one will start only running on day on, in the middle of day four. Job two will probably fit uh, on processor one uh, just before that. So it will start running in a few hours on day one and so on for smaller jobs, right? So this is actually what it will look like. So currently running jobs are in blue and the jobs that are scheduled are in pink. And of course, uh, the highest priority job will not necessarily run first because there are just not enough resources available, right? So in this case, it will run just, well, in the middle of day four. So uh, of course, uh, this picture is not static. It changes all the time. So jobs finish running, jobs get canceled, uh, even waiting jobs get canceled and uh, new jobs are submitted. So some of them will have higher priority than your job. Some of them will have low, low priority. So this, uh, this uh, picture is evaluated every, rebuilt every, uh, I don't know, every, uh, 10 minutes, perhaps every 30 minutes. So I don't know exactly how long the, the schedule cycle is. And uh, things change. So for example, uh, the top picture shows you, shows you the current state of the cluster from the previous slide. And let's imagine that the last job was uh, just canceled. So that's the one uh, shown in, uh, in, uh, in yellow, the running job was, was killed. And now you have more resources for now because now you have processor four available. So what will happen? So if you work through the same, uh, the same uh, procedure, uh, you actually see that uh, the, first run, uh, the first job to start running will job number three. It will start running earlier than before because now you have more resources. Job number one will start running earlier because all four processes will be available earlier, but job number two will actually start running later, not, uh, not, uh, not uh, in a few hours, but it will actually run in the middle of day five, which is uh, completely counterintuitive, but this is what the algorithm gives you. Uh, so the fact that now somebody uh, cancel a job or some job finished running and now you have more uh, idle resources does not mean that your job will necessarily start running sooner. So it actually, so sometimes it, it will mean that, sometimes it will mean quite the opposite, okay? So uh, we build by uh, core equivalent. Uh, so that means that remember the number four gigabytes per node that I mentioned, uh, sorry, per core that I mentioned before. So uh, if you submit a serial job that is using uh, more than uh, four gigabytes, so let's say six gigabytes of memory, you're using a larger fraction of the cluster. So you're still using one CPU, but you're using more memory than your fair share. So that goes into billing and we will bill you by the largest of the number of cores you're using and the memory by core equivalence that you're using. So for example, if you're running a single core job that takes six gigabytes for one day, we'll actually bill you for 36 hours, uh, six, uh, sorry, 36 core hours, because effectively you're, you're using memory that is, uh, that is uh, an equivalent of uh, one and a half uh, CPUs. So the same for GPU petitions. Uh, there we build in uh, GPU equivalents or GPU hours, and that is the largest of the number of GPU hours you use, core hours you use, and the memory you use. So submitting a serial job, uh, it's really very simple. Uh, so here's the top of the slide, we have a, a serial script where I say echo, the script is running on, so echo in bash is just a print statement. Then we print uh, the host name and then we wait for 20 seconds and then the jump finishes. So you put this into a uh, script, and actually let me do this uh, right on uh, right here, so I switch to uh, Cedar. Uh, let me switch to a temporary directory. Uh, there's nothing here, and then with Nano, I'll open. I don't know. I'll just say simple dot sh a script, and then I'll start typing. So first uh, number sign exclamation mark uh, bin bash. So this is called Shebang, and basically this line tells 
uh, tells uh, Linux uh, which interpreter I'm going to, uh, it, it will have to use to process my scripts. I'm writing in bash, so that's why I have to use the bash interpreter. And then I'm going to say echo, what was it? Uh, this script is running on, script is running on. Then I'm going to print the host name and then I'm going to sleep, wait for 20 seconds. Okay, so let me save it. So here's my, here's my script. And then if I want to submit it, so usually for most of you, the command should be very simple as batch followed by this uh, script name. So in my case, it will actually fail because I have more than a single allocation. So if uh, you've been added to more than a single allocation, so for example, you have a regular allocation and then you're part of a research group that has a rack allocation, then you will also have to specify the account. And the account is not a Slurm account. It's the account to which uh, the billing goes, right? So effectively, this will be the URAC account or, or a, a default allocation account for, for, your, uh, for, your, for your username. So in my case, what I have to do is I have to supply an option dash dash account is equal to, and then I'm just going to copy uh, the name of the account I want to use. And then it will submit successfully. So it will return the uh, job ID and then I can see SQ minus U my username and it should show the state of the job. So it's actually running. You see a ST column, it says R running and uh, it's still running. So let me see. Remember there was a, command to sleep for 20 seconds. Uh, so that will take at least 20 seconds. And then uh, let me check again. So running, so let me uh, show you the output. So the output went into the slurm dash job ID dot out file. So let's see what, what it has. So it has the output from my job. So the script is running on and then the output of the host name command. And let me just check once again if the job yeah, and the job finished running, so it no longer shows in the list of my active jobs, okay? So, of course, uh, usually you want to pass more flags, so specify memory, specify maximum runtime, and this is done via uh, via uh, Sloan flags. So you can either specify these flags after the sbash command, or even better, you would put these flags into your shell script. So here's an example of the shell script in the middle of the slide that shows uh, the maximum runtime five minutes. So that means that after five minutes, your job will get killed, even if it doesn't finish. Uh, then option, I can specify the job name, quick test. I'm asking for 100 megabytes for the job, and then I'm specifying my account, and then the command to, to, to run, that I want to run. So in this case, it's uh, something called serial executable. So uh, the default memory, if you don't specify memory, the default memory that we give to each job is very small. It's in the low hundreds of megabytes. So almost always you want to specify memory. And probably it's good to specify the maximum runtime as well because you don't want to ask for much more than you actually need because otherwise your job will end up waiting a very long time in the queue. Okay. So. Uh, Every jobs are a very handy tool of submitting a bunch of uh, serial jobs that all have the same executable, all have the same memory and runtime uh, estimates, but you're just submitting not a single job, uh, but uh, a, a bunch of serial jobs. And so this is uh, equivalent to, uh, essentially equivalent to submitting, uh, let's say you want to submit, in this case, I'm specifying 30 jobs. So this is, this, uh, this shell script will submit uh, 30, 30, um, 30 calculations as 30 jobs, but it will use a single script. So this is equivalent to running as batch 30 times, but the big advantage here is that for the scheduler, it's much, much easier to um, uh, to fit into uh, into its uh, schedule the um, uh, 30 every jobs as opposed to 30 individual jobs uh, submitted separately. So that's the only uh, difference. And these jobs, they use the same executable, but they can still do different things. So uh, different ways you can you can do that. For example, you can uh, call different input files or you can uh, use different script names uh, that will contain the number of uh, the job in your job array. So submitting OpenMP and threaded jobs are very similar, except that obviously your executable has to be compiled with the OpenMP flag first for, uh, for shared memory. And then uh, the, the biggest difference here is that you have to specify the, um, uh, so you will specify more than a single CPU, obviously. So in this case, we are passing the option CPUs per task. So that means that you are asking for a single task single MPI task. So that means that uh, this task, all cores in this task will still run 
on a single uh, single node, but in this case, we're asking for four cores. So a single task, but four cores. Four cores all running, all will be on the same node. And then all these cores will running threads that will use the same shared memory space on, on, on this node. And then 100 megabytes is for the whole job, for all threads combined. Right? And then you will see what the script does. So it picks up the environment uh, variable slurm CPUs per task that contains the number of CPUs, so in this case four. And then it passes it into a bash environment variable OpenMP number of threads. And it's important to set this variable in your, in your script so that at runtime, uh, your OpenMP code knows how many, how many threads to start, right? So that's why we need to set, set OpenMP num threads by hand in the uh, job submission script. So that's for OpenMP jobs. For MPI jobs, message passing interface, uh, of course, now we can run uh, uh, on more than a single node. So all you have to do is specify the number of uh, tasks. Uh, so in this case, in the middle, we have the script in the middle of the slide. We're asking for four MPI uh, tasks. And so these tasks will run on four cores. And whether these four cores are on the same node or on different nodes, you don't know. But uh, in most cases, it doesn't matter because they will use message passing, message passing interface. So it will send messages to exchange information between different copies of your code running on these four cores, whether they are on the same node or on different nodes. And the flags here are somewhat different. So we're asking not a uh, number of CPUs per, per task, but we're asking for number of tasks and then uh, time, maximum time. Uh, so uh, memory per CPU. So you see now we're asking for 100 megabytes per, per CPU. So 100 megabytes for each MPI uh, task. And then uh, finally, uh, in the last command, when you call the executable, make sure that uh, you pass it to the SRUN wrapper. And what SRUN does, it actually picks up the right environment. So it's, it will start your MPI code uh, on how many cores? Uh, how many? How many cores were allocated uh, to your job by the scheduler? Uh, so submitting GPU jobs very similar. You just need to specify the number of uh, the number of GPUs that you're going to use. So in this case, I'm going to use a single GPU, and then uh, uh, sorry, single. I'm asking for four. No, sorry, three nodes and a single uh, GPU per node. So a total of uh, three GPUs. So memory per node, maximum runtime, and then and then you also pass uh, you pass executable to the SRUN command that will pick up the uh, right number of uh, nodes and, and 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 GPUs. So interactive jobs are very handy for uh, doing tests. So the idea of an interactive job is uh, you, you start a job and then you get this interactive environment, interactive Linux shell where you can actually run things. So in this case, if I run Salloc, I ask for one hour and for two tasks. And then uh, once this job starts running, you can actually uh, do things. You have two cores for an hour available to you. And then you can run a serial code. You can run a, a parallel code that will span two cores. And then uh, you can test your parallel code. So let's actually run the quick demo. So I'm going to say uh, Salloc. And then I need to specify my account in my case, the account I'm going to use. And then uh, I'm going to use uh, dash dash time. Let's well, just specify something very small. Let's say 15 minutes. And then I'm going to ask for two, uh, two MPI tasks, so two cores. So let's see. If it gets started, so it says granted job allocation. OK, ready for the job. Excellent. So now I have an environment with two cores. And you can actually uh, print that. So you have access to a bunch of Sloan variables. And uh, one of them should list the number of uh, processes. Yeah, so now I have two processes available to me. And I can actually start either serial code, or that will obviously be a waste because I have two cores. So I can start actually a two core parallel code and, and test my code here, right? So if I have a, a code here, I will actually say SRUN and then followed by the executable name, and then it will actually run on two, on two processes. Real, so really handy for testing. But of course, once you exceed your specified uh, maximum runtime, in my case, it was 15 minutes. After 15 minute, minutes, that interactive job will get killed. Um, so it's very important to specify uh, memory correctly, because <clears throat> if you don't ask for enough memory, uh, then your job will be killed when it exceeds your memory estimate. Uh, simply because you have only so much memory that was allocated to your job. And if you ask for too much, then, uh, well, your job will start running. But the problem is you're asking for larger share of the cluster. And it will take longer time for uh, the scheduler to feed your job into, into, the, well, into, into, uh, the, um, into the cluster. So it's really useful to know the amount of memory that you want to use in your job uh, very well, fairly accurately. And so take some number that you think you're going to use and then maybe add, I don't know, 10, 15, 20% uh, on top of that. Because otherwise, if your job uh, 
as I said, if your job reaches the uh, memory limit that you specify, it will get killed. So the question is, how do you know how much memory you uh, you will need? So the answer is actually not a very simple uh, simple uh, question to answer. Uh, because uh, because uh, you ideally you want to know uh, your code you don't want to know what structures data structures it allocates and then and then starting from that you will know how much memory your code is going to use but in many cases you don't have a good understanding of the code sometimes you're just running an executable that was compiled by somebody else and then you really have no idea how much memory is going to use so the second best way is actually to use the SACCT command that, pro, that, that prints out the uh, maximum memory that, would use, well, that, that was used by your code. So you will see SACCT minus G followed by the job ID uh, and then dash dash format and then the fields that you want to get printed. So in my case, I want to print, let's say, job ID, the maximum uh, amount of memory that it, 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 it used, the maximum resident set size and elapsed time, so how long it took for, for the job to run. And then it will print that for a completed job. So the caveat here is that uh, Sloan um, probes that for all running jobs, once a minute, perhaps maybe twice a minute, I don't know how, how, that, how often it does it, but sometimes if your job suddenly uh, allocated a lot of structures and suddenly started using a lot of memory and then it was, it was killed because of that, so sometimes a Sloom might not have had not enough time to uh, probe your um, spike in memory usage and then it will not have it in, in the record and then your job will, will be killed because it used uh, too much memory, but then that will not be in the slim record. So that is tricky and there's no really good way around that besides understanding, uh, besides uh, just testing your job and trying to understand how, how much memory it uses. So for example, one trick you could do is try to uh, scale your job. So try to run a smaller version of your job, perhaps for a smaller system, and then uh, check how much memory it uses and then try to scale it up to the problem size that you want to tackle and then see how much memory, uh, how much more memory you're using. And then hopefully it's a, it's a monotonic trend that is going to uh, give you the, uh, an accurate number, accurate estimate for the actual production job. So why my job is not running, we often get uh, ask this question and the answer is uh, not, I mean, there's no simple answer. So there could be a number of things. So it could be a problem with the scheduler, could be a problem. Uh, so sometimes if somebody submits a lot of jobs, let's say 10,000 jobs and then cancels them and then resubmits them and so on. Uh, we actually, uh, I mean, the, the slum scheduler, it, it needs to do an optimization job, trying to uh, optimization, trying to fit all those 10,000 jobs into the grade. And it takes obviously some time to do this. And, uh, and uh, if uh, people abuse the scheduler, then it'll become slow and unresponsive. So sometimes we have to, to reschedule it. Sometimes we have to do other maintenance things. So, but very often uh, the, uh, the answer to the question why my job is not running is actually much simpler than that. So somebody just submitted a bunch of high priority jobs and the jo those jobs were scheduled uh, before before your job, simply because that user has a high priority. So if you're still you're still uh, not sure, if you don't know what to do and uh, things don't work as uh, well, reasonably well, then by all means let us know. Send us an email at support at computecanada.ca and we'll get back to you soon. So finally, best practices. Uh, just a couple of slides listing the best practices for computing and for file systems. So for computing, I already mentioned this very briefly. Uh, please don't run anything on the login nodes because login nodes. So those are the nodes uh, where you find yourself when you log into the cluster. They're really meant for compiling jobs, for looking at files, for very simple things, but not for CPU intensive things. So if you start running anything CPU intensive on the login node, the login node will be very slow for everybody. And uh, most likely will contact you, will kill your job, will, will kill your processes on the login node and will ask you to submit things to the compute nodes where all production jobs should go. So only request memory and runtime that you need, perhaps with a little bit of a cushion. Uh, always test things before scaling. So, and that is important, especially for, uh, for uh, large parallel codes. So parallel codes always have some uh, limitations to how well they can scale. So don't just take a parallel code, a special community code that somebody else wrote and run it on let's say 128 cores because it might actually not scale that well to 128 cores. It might actually be slower on 128 cores than on let's say 64 or 32 cores. So always before any large parallel runs, uh, test the uh, scaling efficiency of the code. So run it on let's say single core, two cores, four cores, eight cores, and just see how things scale. And you might be actually surprised. You will be surprised quite often. So for faster turnaround for larger jobs, uh, request whole nodes. This only applies to large parallel jobs. So a larger fraction of the cluster can um, uh, can run uh, whole nodes, whole node jobs, or where only a small, uh, well, not a small, a subs um, a subsection of uh, the cluster for CD and RAM 
can uh, run the uh, the uh, serial and uh, by core jobs. So uh, always when you compile uh, compile codes, make sure to pass the optimization flags, so dash O2 or dash O3, especially for the GNU compiler. So be smart in your choice of programming language. So some languages are slow. So uh, Python, R, Java, and MATLAB are slow as well. Uh, so if, if possible, especially if you're writing a new code, uh, it's a very good idea to write it in a compiled language. So things like C, C++, Fortran, Chapel, that will give you much higher, much higher performance, unless you're using pre-compiled libraries in Python and R. Uh, best practices for the file system, so I already mentioned it, don't store millions of files, or millions of small files, so try to either write very large files from your, from your output or just use uh, tar commands to tar uh, your files into large archives. Uh, so do not store data as ASCII, large data as ASCII, simply because it's not efficient. So store it as binary, and that will give you a factor of four to five more, uh, well, better, uh, better efficiency in terms of uh, disk space used. Uh, so use the right file systems. Already mentioned uh, at the beginning that some file systems, things like home and archive file systems, are really not meant for for uh, fast access. So for fast access, for, for storing lots and lots of output from, from your numerical code, use the scratch file system. And, uh, and uh, yeah, so have a backup plan, regularly clean things up, and uh, all just the things that, that make sense. So uh, finally, I'm gonna uh, put this slide uh, with uh, documentation, so links to various resources. So we have documentation for pretty much everything that I mentioned today and, and much more on our uh, website, docscomputercanada.ca. It's a wiki that everybody can edit. So if you find that some things are missing, then you can log into this website and actually edit it yourself. Of course, somebody will review your edits. Uh, we have some getting starting, started videos that are linked here. And they're quite useful, but they're a little bit outdated because they were produced last year when Niagara was still not available. And uh, for all questions, send an email to support computer Canada dossier. So this goes to the ticketing system, and then somebody will answer your, your question usually within a few hours. You'll, you'll get a response. Uh, so finally, get to know your local support. Uh, so we have staff at most institutions, and it's always good to know uh, your local Computer Canada staff simply because you can always approach them, and it's nice to have a face-to-face -face chat, especially if you are a new user. And uh, finally, uh, here's a list of, I already mentioned, uh, several 809 uh, webinars that we have scheduled this fall. So here's the full list of currently scheduled webinars. And for the up-to-date schedule and links to register, uh, please go to this website at the top, so Training Materials website where we collect uh, not just the schedule of, uh, of um, our, uh, our upcoming presentations, but also we put all the recent training materials. So for example, a video of this talk, the PDF slides of this talk, and things like that that were all archived, that all archived at this uh, training page. So on that note, I will uh, stop here and I will open the floor for questions. So if you have a question, you can either uh, type it uh, or you can unmute yourself and just ask the question uh, via by audio. Hi, Alex, thank you for the presentation. Uh, my question is in regard to S account. Uh, I didn't quite understand how to use that to uh, determine the code's memory. It seems like that's something that would be running as the program runs. So I was hoping maybe you could just review that again. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, let me show you a demo. So actually, I, I just submitted the job. Uh, so this job on, on, uh, yeah, on CETA, that was so, uh, actually, let me scroll back. So the last submitted job was an interactive job. And before that, I ran a job, I ran this job, right? So 119 and so on. So actually, let me, uh, yeah, I'm still on CETA on the login node on CETA. So let me run this ACCT command. So I'll say SCT minus J, followed by the job ID number right here. And then I'm gonna say dash dash format, and then uh, let me consult the flags. So job ID max RSS, uh, job ID. Uh, these are the fields that I wanna see printed. Max, uh, maximum resident set size, so for the maximum of memory. And then elapsed time elapsed. Let me see what, what it gives me. Okay, so it gave me, uh, it gave me this output. So basically it says, the, the, here's the job ID number. So here's the amount of memory that was used at different steps. So just pick up the largest of them. So eat almost a megabyte and then 27 seconds. So my job ran for 27 seconds. I used almost a megabyte of memory. 
And then the reason why it ran for 27 seconds is because I had the sleep 20 command, which was waiting for 20 seconds, right? So, but basically pick up the largest number in this call, maximum resonance set size. So these are different, uh, different stages of your job. Pick up the largest number and this will tell you how much memory you used. Okay. So this would be, so this would be, I see using this in conjunction with sort of starting a smaller job and seeing how much memory is used for that smaller job and then scaling. So do those two go hand in hand? Yes, and the same for the for the bigger jobs as well. So you can you can run the same as ACCT command for a bigger job, a completed job, and it will tell you how much memory the job used. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Let me see. Uh, do you have any training material for running ANSYS Workbench? This link doesn't say much about that. So unfortunately, I don't know the answer because I have not worked with ANSYS software myself. Uh, so to get a, an answer from, from us, uh, simply send this question to support at computecanada.t. So because you mentioned that our ANSYS page doesn't provide the answer, so send this, this question to support computecanada.t and this will go to ticket and somebody will answer it because I don't know the answer about ANSYS. Uh, link of the slides, uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, let me put the link, I should put it on each slide. So here's the link to the slides. Check if there are any email questions. Okay, there are no email questions. Okay, are there any other questions? You can always send me an email. My email is right there on the slide, alex.razumov at wisegrid.ca or to support as well. I don't see any other questions in the chat. Excellent, so thank, thanks everybody. And this, this talk is gonna be uh, archived as video on the training materials website. So uh, actually let me uh, put the Last slide back on. So the training materials website right there, Westgate training materials. Uh, so in a few days, uh, the screencast of this talk is gonna be published there as well. So thanks everybody.